Welcome in to another episode of the Think Deeper podcast. Uh, we've got our second episode of the season today. I'm your host, Jack Wilkie. Uh, I'm excited for this one. It's our first interview of the season. Uh, we have Bob Turner with us today. He is the director of the Sunset Academy of Leadership Training at the Sunset International Bible Institute. Uh, very excited to have him here, as I said. Uh, I've known him for over a decade now, and uh, I've, he's he's been into leadership for quite some time. I remember you had a, a blog and, and updates and all that, uh, emails, uh, oh, again, back 10, 10 plus years ago, and, and so now he's written a book on it. He's uh, working at this uh, academy, and so uh, welcome in. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it, and I certainly have a great passion for what we're going to be talking about today. All right, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the Academy of Leadership Training, SALT uh, is the acronym. Okay. Uh, SALT was started for the purpose of being a resource to congregations. Uh, the intent is to provide various tools that will help churches in, in developing leaders and uh, I think of it from the standpoint of we want to strengthen those who are currently leading, but we also want to encourage others to become leaders. And for me, the biggest piece is we want to put in place with each congregation a plan for developing the next generation. Who's going to lead when our current leadership is gone? And so we really work hard to provide all the necessary tools that allows congregations to be able to do those three things. And so on the website, which is salt.sunset.bible, uh, salt.sunset.bible, there are tons of resources. Uh, we have over 90 lessons that are designed for a Bible class format that congregations can download, and they can use those to teach on an ongoing basis in all the areas involving leadership. Uh, obviously, we have a number of podcasts, and we have what we call salt talks, kind of like the TED Talks version of leadership, where we spend about eight minutes reviewing, talking about specific subjects. And then the blog that I have now is on there as well under the Salt Journal, where it's just kind of a daily post of something people can read in less than a minute that talks a little bit about leadership. And the website also identifies all the various areas that we do as far as workshops and seminars to help in areas of leadership. All right. So very important work. Uh, I mean, anyone who's been a part of a church knows, uh, I mean, leadership sets the tone. Leadership uh, drives everything. And so uh, all of that uh, is available at salt.sunset.bible, right? All, all those resources? Yes. All right. So uh, you guys be sure to check that out. Uh, the other thing that, that I wanted to talk about today, and I guess uh, we'll spend most of our time talking about, is your new book. Uh, well, relatively new, I guess, in the last year or two. Uh, right. Essential Building Blocks for Life and Leadership. Uh, we actually, you can get it on Amazon, but you guys should actually go buy it from focuspress.org. Uh, we're carrying it. That's so. right the best place to get it. Um, go ahead and, and tell us about that a little bit. The, the building blocks for life, it's a very interesting concept you came up with for this. Well, the book, well, it, it came about during the, the pandemic. And I'm sitting at the house one day trying to figure out everything is locked down. And it's mm -hmm. like, what do I do? And my son said, you should write a book. And I was <laughs> like, okay, write a book. And so I have been teaching for a number of years uh, about uh, what I consider to be uh, essential components of leadership. I've, I've read so many books that just have lists of things that, that leaders need to know and do, and they're all really good books. But I thought somehow there should be a book that we could narrow it down uh, that really focuses in on just some essential elements. And so... For me, uh, I align them with what uh, are identified as four essential elements for life. Uh, for life to exist on this planet, you have to have the sun, you have to have water, you have to have air, you have to have food. And so those four essential elements became kind of the basis for which I tried to align uh, a component of leadership that goes with them. For example, you have to have the sun in order for us to have sight or to be able to see. And so for a leader, he has to have vision. And without vision, um, we tend to just wander around. We don't really know where we're going. We don't know how we're going to get there or even why we're trying to get there. And, and so vision becomes a very foundational piece to that. And then I just move from that to, to the next piece and talk about we have to have air. 
in order for life. And, and it's funny, this really began with a particular quote about air. Several years ago in a book called The Magic of Thinking Big uh, by David Schwartz, he made this statement that uh, goals are as essential to success as air is to life. And so based on that, I thought, well, goals are essential, just mm -hmm. like air is essential. So I kind of lined it up based on that particular quote from him. And certainly when people have goals and they, they know what they're working to try to achieve, it really makes a big difference in, in really breathing life into them and, and helping them want to move forward. And so I kind of aligned it that way. And then we talk about the idea of water and character. Uh, most of this earth, most of our bodies are all made up of water. I mean, it's the very substance with which life exists. And without water, there is no life. And so the same is true with character. Without really a trustworthy character is kind of what I focus on in the book is without developing that type of trustworthy character, it's, it's really difficult to have much substance to our leadership because people will not follow someone they do not trust. Mm -hmm. And so that characteristic is, is vital and essential to that. And then the last part is, it was really the one that was most interesting to me because several years ago, I started looking into a number of elements about food and, and I love to eat as most of us do. And uh, it was interesting to learn some things about enzymes, which are a part of all the food that we eat. And those enzymes, are designed to, as one lady says, they're nature's activists. They're what give us life. And so I thought, what is it that really sparks our leadership? And it's passion. And so mm -hmm. I spent the last section of the book talking about passion and, and how passion needs to be the fuel for our leadership and what we do. But it's not just the, the level of excitement uh, or enthusiasm that we tend to take along with that, but it really has to do with what we're willing to give up. Mm -hmm. It's about that original term of to suffer, uh, passion from the Latin that, that deals with suffering. And what is it that we're willing to give up in order to be a leader of God's people? But that those four components, in, in looking back in hindsight, I'm thankful to have the book done. I wish now I had done four books uh -huh. and really spent more time in dividing each of those uh, into a book in and of themselves that would have allowed uh, the reader to really focus on one area instead of trying to tie it all together. But it is what it is at this point. <laughs> right. and, uh, I'm thankful to have it done and, and working on a second book now, but oh, cool. uh, I'm excited to have that first one done. Yeah, it, it's it's really great stuff. And as you said, I mean, there's a billion leadership books, but, but you did a great job of boiling it down to the essentials of, of things of if you're going to get started as a leader, if you are a leader, as I was going through it, um, and just the, each of these points, these elements, the the, the text of your book, uh, the the thought that kept coming back to me was the the uh, famously attributed to Socrates, the uh, one about the unexamined life is not worth living, right? And it's very similar of, of the unexamined leadership. If, if you're just a leader, but you don't have the vision, you don't have the goals, you don't have the character, you don't have the passion, uh, and that's what your book kind of kept putting in my mind is we can get in these positions and not really stop and think about what am I doing? Why am I a leader? What am I trying to do as a leader? And and I think uh, the book really gives uh, a clarity to that of, you know, what what to look for, what, what to consider about yourself as a leader and, and what you're trying to do. And uh, from each of those four angles, which, you know, as, as you say, are, are essentials to leadership. Um, yeah, oh, it's, it was interesting as I... As I thought about the four elements that are essential for life to exist, you can't take away any one of them. Right. If you take away the sun, life doesn't exist. You may have the sun, but if you don't have water, life doesn't exist. You may have the sun and water, but if you don't have food, life doesn't exist, and so on. Mm. And the same to me is really true with leadership. You may have goals, you may have passion, and you may have character, but if you don't have a vision, then your leadership is going to suffer. Mm -hmm. And if you have vision, and you have goals, but you don't have the character to lead, then people won't follow. And the right. same is true with all of them. I mean, they're all essential elements that work together to really make our leadership successful. That's really true. That's a great way of putting it. Um, you know, there really is an, an aimlessness sometimes that can set in uh, with without these things of not, you know, as you said, with character of looking at yourself as a leader and saying, who am I being? Am I somebody worth following? Um, with, with the passion of 
do I care about this? Uh, there was, uh, I'm going to diverge a little bit here. Uh, you, you put an illustration in there that I remember you preaching Oh, some, something around 15 years ago when I was a, a preaching student. Uh, you came and, and spoke uh, in chapel uh, about uh, a football coach. I think he was at Arkansas at the time, Houston Nutt, uh, and the three questions. And so I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. I didn't put this in the info uh, that, I, that I sent you, but um, I, I've always found that fascinating. It stuck with me when you preached all those years ago. Uh, reading it in the book, it, it just brought it back to mind. But that's really this, this thought of aimlessness versus really locking into what you're doing. You, can you go over those three questions there? I would, for a I'd be glad to. I love that section, and, and it's a, a big piece of what I continue to teach. And we were at a Chamber of Commerce banquet, and Houston Nutt at the time was the head football coach of the Arkansas Razorback football program. And, and he started telling everybody about every incoming freshman. Uh, they sit down with, as a staff with them and try to emphasize the privilege that it is to be an Arkansas Razorback. And then he said, we asked them three questions. The first is, can I trust you? Can I trust you to go to class? Can I trust you to do the work the professors assign? Can I trust you? And the second question is, are you committed? Are you committed to being an Arkansas Razorback? Are you committed to, to give 100% of your effort on the field and off the field? Are you committed? And when he asked the third question, I really don't know what he said about the Razorback football program after that point. Just remember thinking to myself, okay, this changes everything. Because he, the third question is, do you care? And immediately I thought, okay, if you take a group of people that you can trust, who are committed, and they care, you can change the world. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought, that's what leaders need to be. And then I really back up and I focus in just on that first question. And I trust you. And, and all my life, I've heard sermons about trusting God, and, and I get it. I know that we need to put our complete and total trust in God. I fully understand that. But I, I, in that moment, I thought, what about in the reverse? Mm -hmm. Can God trust me? Mm -hmm. Can he trust me to, to be a good student of his word? Can he trust me to, to reach out to people who are outside of Christ and bring them into his body? Can, can he trust me to love the church? Can he trust me to lead? And, and it's just the list goes on and on is, can God trust you? Can God trust me? And, and that just made such a difference in the way that I thought about character, the way that I thought about leadership mm -hmm. and, and how character factors into that, because we need to be worthy of God's trust in us and all that he's entrusted to us. And so I, I continue to use that material because it was just such a life-changing moment for me in thinking about so many areas about Christianity, but especially in leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, I mean, if it, I'm sure, you know, an elder or a minister, somebody that's that's in a leadership role listening to this, think through those questions. Think through if, if God asked you those things. And, yeah. and you know, the people of a congregation are asking those same things, whether they, they know they are or not, of does this leader, is there, are they trustworthy? Are they committed to this? Do they care? Because... I think this is one of these things that uh, you learn from experience and, and uh, you know, in, in leadership anytime at all, the people reflect the leadership, you know, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, that, that's something uh, that's a big part of this. And if the leader doesn't care or if the leader is not trustworthy or if the leader is not committed, everyone else kind of comes to the point of why should I be? Um, and so very important for that. That uh, takes me to another, one other thing I wanted to discuss from the book. Uh, one or two, I guess. Uh, I say one. We'll see. Um, you bring up Mordecai and Esther, the definition, uh, a good definition of a leader from there. Uh, he was written as one who seek, or sought the good of his people and spoke up for their welfare. Uh, it's a great, short, easy to remember definition of a leader. Can you talk about that a little bit? Why that that's the one you kind of ran with early on in the book? Well, it, the whole thing was very interesting because when I, when I do a workshop with a congregation, I usually start by asking them to, if they were going to give one word to describe leadership, what word would it be? And then to use that word in a sentence to define leadership as they understand it. I do the exercise for the purpose of helping people see that it's very difficult it's very difficult to choose just one word, mm -hmm. and it's even more difficult to try and define leadership. And ultimately, in, and I divide uh, work, the workshops up with small groups, and so we usually have four or five different tables. 
And, and I show them, everybody comes up with a different answer. And so when you're working with a congregation, it's very hard to get everybody on the same page mm -hmm. because everybody else is thinking, well, this is my word and this is how I would define leadership. And it makes it very hard for them to try and pick out someone who's going to serve as a deacon or an elder or whatever that role may be. And so once they do that, I take them back and talk about the book of Esther. And it's not a book that we would normally think of for leadership. We, we use Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about Moses. I mean, David. Mm -hmm. we, we look in so many direct, directions to talk about leaders, but rarely do we think of Esther. And I was sitting in a workshop uh, a couple of years ago, and Ken Jones was speaking about the heart of leadership, and he made reference to Esther, and he made reference to getting everybody over to the very last verse in the book, chapter 10, verse 3. And when he read that, I thought, that's it. it it's a way to help simplify the whole idea of what a leader is. I mean, when we're looking for someone to be a leader in the church, look for people who are going to they're they're going to do good <laughs> they're going to speak for the welfare i mean that's that's what they're after they're seeking to do good for the people and they're seeking to speak on on behalf of them or their welfare and i thought you find people like that you're going to find some pretty good leaders you're going to find people who will follow now mm -hmm. i know that there are other components that go into that biblically but at the same time if that's the foundation that we're looking for it, it can help everybody be on the same page and it shows a good positive direction uh, and I just love that. And so I've been using it ever since. I told Ken I stole it. He said, <laughs> right. you can't steal it. It's biblical. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's true. But it's another one of these things that, you know, as a leader examines himself or if somebody prepares to be a leader, to just use that and look at that and say, is this me? Does this describe me? Am I trying to be somebody that, that can be described by this? Uh, just short and, and to the point, speaking for the good of the people, speaking up for or seeking the good of the people, speaking up for their welfare. But um, you know, when I read that in the, the book, I thought, man, that, that really does capture it really well. Um, okay, one other uh, uh, focus from the book. Uh, the first element, the sun, is, is vision, sight, you know, looking ahead. Uh, the second, uh, I believe, is air and, and goals. Can you speak about the difference between the vision and goals, maybe which one comes first, or it kind of, you know, and, unless they, they read it, obviously. Again, guys, go get the book, but... Um, when you hear vision and goals, somebody think, well, isn't that the same thing? So speak about that a little bit if you could. I'm, I'm really glad you asked that because it's, it's one of the things that I really try to spend some time on. And I addressed it in the book, but every time I do a workshop, I try to talk about the difference between vision, mission, and strategic planning or goals and mm -hmm. plans uh, because there is a difference. And when I use the term vision, I'm thinking about who we are going to become. When I use the term mission, I talk about what we're going to do to get there. And then the goals and the strategic planning piece are the specifics of how we will do that. Uh, oftentimes, I, I'll run into someone who's a little resistant about the idea of the church having a vision. And they're like, we already have a vision. And I'm like, well, what is it? And they'll say, well, it's Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. And I'm like, no, that's the mission. God, that's the reason we call it the great co-mission. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the mission that God has given us to go and make disciples of all nations. Right. But the vision has, has more to do with who we are going to become. I, I really encourage people to uh, think about the book of Nehemiah. And I'll ask them, what was his vision? And it's almost inevitably somebody will say, well, it was to rebuild the wall. I say, no, that was his mission. But if you look at chapter 2, verse 17, it's very clear. He describes for them the problem that exists. The walls have been torn or torn down. The gates have been burned. And he says, so let us arise and build. That's the solution. That's mm -hmm. the mission. Let's, let's arise and build the walls. But then he describes the reason for it. And that is so that we will no longer be a reproach among the nations. His vision was for God's people to be restored to the people that they once were. That's who he wanted them to be, was God's chosen people that God had planned from the be beginning when he gave that promise to Abraham. And so the way that they were going to be able to do that first was they had to have the goal of finishing the rebuilding of the wall because they couldn't rebuild the temple until the wall was done. And so all of those kind of go into that. I also encourage people to look at the prayers of Paul. 
when you look at his letters that were written like to the church at Colossae or even Ephesus, mm -hmm. when you look at those letters, it's very clear that Paul's vision for who he wanted them to become uh, is it, beautifully described. And so I usually encourage people when they go through a workshop and, I, and they get down to that component of actually writing the vision is, here, take a look at these components and, and notice the terminology and the description. And, and I tend to say it's the noun and the verb mm. uh, of, of that whole process. Your noun describes who you're going to become, and the verb is what you're going to do to achieve that. And then, of course, the, the pieces of goals and planning involved, the specifics. Uh, and when I get down to that section, we have a separate workshop that we do in talking about strategic planning. And I give everyone a number of tools in which I highlight them in the book about a SWOT analysis and a SOAR analysis. And I give them a PERT chart template that they can fill in this, what I call just a map. It's, mm -hmm. it's really a map that shows everybody, okay, here's where we are on one side and here's where we want to be on the other side. And in between is January through December and all these categories that are gonna help them see exactly the time and the pieces that are gonna be plugged in in order to achieve their goals. And all of that will help move them closer to their vision. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you an example, and this is just one of many. But I was working with a congregation in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And um, uh, there were three different congregations that were there, and which makes it kind of challenging because you got three different cultures that you're working with within the, in, mm -hmm. in the church. And so one of the men, he brought his son who was 10 years old. And the son, the mother, was working, so they didn't have anyone to keep him, so he just brought him. Well, he sat there all day, never said a word. He just listened, and, and he was, they, they do a lot of small group discussions in the workshop. At the end of the day, they were working on developing their vision statements. And when I came around to that table, they asked me to give theirs, they gave it to me, and then that, that father said, do you want to hear my sons? And I said, yes, mm -hmm. I want to hear it. And I don't even remember anyone else's vision statement from that day, <laughs> but I use his as I show examples around the country. And this little boy said, we want to be the end of your search for a caring church. And I thought, wow, how powerful mm -hmm. that here a 10 year old boy, the way he saw the church, what he wanted the church to become was this caring organization so that when people found it, they didn't need to look anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's a great description. That's not our goal. The goals are going to help us get there. Right. What kind of goals do we need to set? Well, we may need to be involved in helping at the homeless mission, right. or we may need to be involved at the crisis pregnancy center or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But those are goals that are going to help us achieve that vision of becoming a church that people care about or that is a caring church for people so that they don't have to look anywhere else. So that's the way I describe the difference between them. And and once people start putting together their vision statements, I think they get it. Up right. front, it's hard for them to see it, but then right. in the end, they're like, okay, now now it comes together. Right, so who to be and then what you're going to do as, as in the process of being that or as part of being that. Right. Yeah. All right, that's really good. Uh, that's very useful stuff. Yeah, you mentioned the the... Uh, SWOT and SOAR and PERT analysis and, and kind of those charts. Uh, I, I was reading that. I'm like, you know, I'm familiar with this stuff, but I haven't thought about it. And especially, um, you know, in in relation to church stuff, I was thinking, I, we got to use this. You know, I'm going to uh, get together with my elders and, and really kind of self-evaluate. I mean, there's just stuff in there that's that's very practical. Uh, so really enjoyed that part. All right. Um, before we get out of here, I'm going to throw a few very specific questions at you uh, for people okay. in different situations. Um, obviously, the last year has been a very difficult time for leadership in churches. Uh, I mean, they've had to navigate, you know, governmental regulations. Um, are we going to meet or not meet? Or are we going to put together some kind of outdoor? Are we going to do online? What are we doing? Uh, you know, when we come back in the building, will it be with masks, without masks? People really want one thing and really want the other. And um, that, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard stories as, as I have as well of churches really dividing over this. It hasn't been easy. Um, it, with you kind of in the trenches working with churches, helping um, with their leadership, what advice would you give? What, did, uh, what, what feedback, what, uh, any input you might give those that are in that situation? Um, how long is this podcast? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
it's it has been so challenging and it has forced us into situations of conflict that we're trying to to navigate i really appreciate the term that you use navigating because it was interesting to me when i i looked online for a number of synonyms in regards to leadership and you find you know chief and commander and executive and ceo and boss and all these different terms mm -hmm. and i never saw the word navigator and and yet that's what leaders are trying to do especially during this time they're trying to navigate through such tumultuous times uh, of, of people who are, are struggling so much with, okay, should we wear the mask? And, and and like you said, there are congregations that have divided. There are people who are saying, we're not coming back as long as we have to wear a mask. And others are saying, we're not coming back unless we have to wear the mask. Yeah. And so it's just been so challenging. And what I've done is I put together a number of different lessons that kind of addressed several components that I think are helpful. And I'll just share a couple of them. Uh, one is, is it's going to take a great deal of courage mm -hmm. for, for leaders to be able to navigate this time. And, and they're going to have to make decisions that they wouldn't normally have to make. And the way I describe courage to people is to not think of it in terms of a, a quality that they develop or possess, but rather about a decision that they have to make when they're scared to death. Mm -hmm. and, and it is hard when people are scared to try to make those kind of decisions. It takes a great deal of courage to to decide what they're going to do and how they're going to lead uh, in the midst of, of the conflict that they're dealing with. But the other thing is, is they're going to have to change. They're going to have to change the way that they think. They're going to have to change perhaps the way that they lead and the way they've led in the past has been so um, comfortable for them. This is the way they've always led. Mm -hmm. and, and now they're having to lead differently. So they're going to have to make some changes and and I realize that change is one of those words that scares people to death and they don't like it, right. but they're going to have to make some changes and they're going to have to rethink uh, the way that they're leading. And, and I think that's why they need a vision to help guide them in that process. Right. But I, I tell you another area that I think um, I'll share the last couple that I think are just vital is they're going to have to, uh, they're going to have to learn how to connect with the congregation differently. Mm -hmm. Um, it is amazing to me how many leaders in the church today are not really connected to the congregation. They're, they sit in, in an office, they make decisions, and they know people based upon seeing them there on Sundays, but so many elders are trying to shepherd congregations that, you know, for example, I, I talked today with a, a gentleman, the congregation is 220 people, they got two elders. Mm. When you're talking about a hundred plus people per elder, it's a lot of work. Those numbers make it so difficult for them to ever connect, mm -hmm. and so um, they need to find out about what's going on. They need to give people an opportunity to talk about what they're experiencing and, and why they feel the way that they do. And they're going to have to connect with them on a different level than just seeing them at the church building. They're going to have to be in their lives. They're going to have to let people be involved in their lives and. And it's okay for them to struggle and to let people know that they're struggling and trying to figure this out. But I, I think that connection with the, with the congregation is just a vital piece. And it kind of really leads to, uh, I'll share this last one, and that is communication. Mm -hmm. I, I, tell, I tell congregations, I've never met anybody yet that said our elders just tell us too much. <laughs> right. They just over communicate. We're so informed. We know everything that's going on. And it's just the opposite. As you know, mm -hmm. most people are like, we have no idea what's going on because the elders never tell us anything. And they don't, to me, it's, it's not just about communicating what's going on. It's, it's explaining why, you know, when my kids are growing up as your kids are growing up. They ask why they want to know when you tell mm -hmm. them, well, we're going to go do this. Well, why, why are we doing that? And, and every time I can explain to them the why behind it, it always satisfied them. And that's what elders are going to have to do. They're going to have to start explaining the why behind the decision. What did they go through? What process did they go through to come to the decision that they did? And explain that to the congregation. And I think congregations will be satisfied once they know why these things are being done and how they're being done in order to do that. And I, if elders will do that, and there are obviously many other components that could go into that, but I think those are, are four that really stand out to me 
that they need courage. They're going to have to be able to change the way that they think and maybe change the way that they lead. Uh, but I think the two big ones is they're going to have to be connected to the congregation. Because if they're not connected, they're just CEOs making decisions that may or may not be in light of, of the direction the congregation needs to go. But they've got to communicate. And communication is probably a foundational component to that. Mm-hmm. No, those are very great points. Very, very practical, useful. Um, on the other side of that, uh, to people who are not leaders, uh, you know, obviously we probably have some that listen to this podcast who are leaders, elders, uh, preachers, ministers, whatever else it may be. I would say the majority probably aren't. Uh, and so uh, I talk to a lot of people, <clears throat> sorry, uh, through uh, my work, uh, my, my previous book with Church Reset, uh, which was uh, about a lot of that, of you know, communication, connectedness, unity, togetherness, all of those things. And a lot of people who say, my church doesn't have visionary leadership. My church, you know, there, there's no plan. There's no in, there's no goals. There, we're, we're not trying to do anything. Uh, there's a lot of frustration there. Uh, I, you know, one of the things I always coach them on is, you know, still show respect, still honor, still, you know, don't, don't grab my book or anybody else's and go shove it in their face and say, you guys are wrong, do this. But um, what what would you say to people who are in that situation where there's some frustration, uh, some uh, uncertainty as to how to follow or, or whether to follow the leaders they have? I, I would tell them not to take my book and shove right. it in their face. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right. <laughs> oh. There, there are a couple of things that, that come to mind right away, and, and I, when I do workshops, I tend to recommend a lot of books, and one of the books that had a big impact for me was a book by John Cotter called Leading Change, and, and it is really challenging if, if a person is not a leader, and how do they get leaders to see the need to do this kind of thing, and in his book, he talks about eight, eight different steps, and I'm not going to go through all the steps, but uh, a couple of them that I think are very significant. One is there has to be a sense of urgency. If we can't create the sense of urgency, then it's difficult for people to see, especially leaders, to see, well, why do we need to do that? And, and I get that. I get a lot of questions in regards to, okay, why do we need a vision? Why do we need to do this? And, and so there has to be a way to create that sense of urgency. And I, the second piece he has is have a guiding coalition. So you got to get other people together that see one person that goes into a, an eldership and says, we need to do this. Mm-hmm. Well, they may or may not have a very good or positive reception from that. But if you take in four or five people and say, look, here's something that we're looking at and, and we would like to discuss it with you. I think it's important to do that. and. I think if they will take those kind of steps, and the other other part of that is, is how plan. Mm-hmm. When you go in to talk to the elders and say, okay, we need a vision, and they, and they say, okay, do you have a plan for doing that? Right, right. And so have some, have some things written out as to, here's why we think we need this, here's how we think we could go about doing it, but have a plan in place when you go in to sit down and talk to someone in leadership and say, we'd like to work on developing a vision, and we want to have some goals and some plans to help guide us as we move forward. Have a plan to do that. Talk about why we need to do it, and then talk about here are some steps that will help us do that, and then have the discussion, and realize it may not happen the first time you go visit. Plant the seed, uh, and then step back in there and say, okay, let's talk about this again. Mm-hmm. And, and I think if if people can do it on a short-term, smaller basis, then people begin to see the morale and the momentum build as they continue to do that. And ultimately, I, th- I think leaders want to know that, and they want to know where they're going and how they're going to lead. Mm-hmm. But And I'm sure you've experienced this. I think one of the biggest problems is, is people who are in a position of eldership, they've never been taught. They've never been taught how to be an elder. They were never taught or trained how to lead the church none of those things and they've certainly never been taught about having a vision for the church and setting goals and plans the main goals they set are to do the same things they did the year before Mm -hmm. they may tweak it and add a new program but generally they've just never been taught and so i think it takes a little time um and and that's why i really emphasize the workshops i i think the workshop explains a lot 
that people don't necessarily get from reading a book or they get from somebody just coming in and sitting down with them. Having that outside source is always helpful um, if, if people can do that. Yeah. But getting them there sometimes is the challenge. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, and, and just a big part of that, of course, uh, just to, to come back around on where I was saying earlier of, of telling people not to disrespect their elders, pray for your elders, uh, you know, if you're in that situation, folks, um, that they would be receptive to something like this, that, that maybe they would schedule a, a workshop, uh, maybe they would uh, read, maybe that, that as, as you said, bringing multiple people in there, that they would have open hearts and, and want to, to grow and change. Because um, I think what you said there is really important that uh, it's not necessarily they're, they're bad people. Sometimes there is an ignorance there of, of they weren't taught they get thrown into the deep end and and not sure what to do with it. And so to close on a, a more positive question, I don't want it to be, you know, the negative parts of leadership, the negative parts of following. Uh, one of the, the big focuses uh, you have, you mentioned earlier, is having a, a growing stock of leaders. We, you know, there are men in their 20s, men in their 30s, men in their 40s, maybe starting a young family or not even married yet or whatever, but thinking towards, you know what, as a member of the church, someday I need to help lead. I, I, I want to be an elder, or maybe if I can't be an elder, if that's not going to work out, I want to you know, be in ministry or, or just be part of the solution. Um, give uh, What are a few steps that, that somebody that is wanting to be a leader someday can start taking right now, even if it's years down the road, what can they start doing now? There's so much material uh, that's available to read on leadership. Uh, I would I would urge people to, to take anything that they can get their hands on to read it. Um, but again, that's that's what I've chosen to do. I mean, I just I try to absorb everything I can continually, even now, to learn as much as I can about leadership and and how to help improve those who are leading. I think that. I'm hesitant to go into too much detail on, on all of this, but to me, there's there's a book called The Multiplication Effect by Mac Lake. It came out in 2020, and he goes into a lot of information that kind of deals with the question that you're asking. And so I, I really would recommend the book uh, for people to learn a lot about, even the model of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You think about how Jesus worked to prepare the next generation, the apostles, to lead. Mm -hmm. I've had people ask me, uh, I worked with a congregation a couple of years ago that they had this gap, and I and it's I think very common in a lot of congregations. You've got younger guys who are wanting to learn how to lead, and you've got older gentlemen who are leading, and that gap in between of that 35 to 55 age group. And this one young man asked me. He said, "They won't step up and do anything." He said, "How how do we move forward with that?" And I said, well, you can't force them right. to lead, and you can't you can't force them to train you how to lead. But what you can do is you can start taking steps now to prepare yourself to be leaders. And, and there are a lot of ways that can be done. Uh, I think it begins with just trying to find material that's going to help them understand more about leadership. I would also suggest that they take on some voluntary positions mm -hmm. uh, that would allow them to lead, whether that's teaching a class or it's taking kids, you know, on a trip and chaperoning, whatever it is, try to find some role that you're comfortable with and, and be able to insert yourself in a leadership position voluntarily to help start that process of learning about people and, and getting connected to people and, and trying to help them uh, in all that they're doing. And so, uh, I think that's just such a critical piece is to, to start leading. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait for somebody to invite you to lead. Right. Learn about leadership and get involved and, right. and start taking those roles. And I think that will be a, a beginning point. And, and let me tell you, those who are in leadership are going to be like, thank you. Right, right. <laughs> and they'll start seeing the need for that. Right. But, uh, it, there's a lot of material that's available if people just look for it and uh, there are books that are that are written, and if somebody would like a list of books, they can shoot me an email, and I'd be glad to give them more than they want to read yeah. on on books that would help them in, in leadership development and preparing for the future. Or just go to the website. As I mentioned earlier, there's a ton of material on the website that they can be used to help strengthen them in that area. All right. Give us the, the web address one more time. It is salt.sunset.bible. Salt. And, and again, 
Yeah, and they'll they'll find tons of material there. All right. And uh, again, the book, uh, Essential Building Blocks for Life and Leadership, I highly recommend. Go check that out. As I said, best place to buy it is focuspress.org. <laughs> That's right. And Amazon, I'm, I'm sure, uh, probably through Sunset's bookstore as well. But uh, uh, go ahead and, uh, I, like I said, I recommend you guys pick that up. Uh, I really want to thank you for joining us. Uh, so much good material there, so much uh, useful, practical, uh, great stuff there. So th- thanks for coming on. Well, thank you. I tell you, it's one of those things I could talk about all day. So <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. All right. I want to thank all of our listeners for tuning in. We look forward to talking to you guys again next week. Again, we've got uh, quite a a few uh, great episodes lined up. We'll be talking about evangelism here soon, Uh, the book of Hebrews with with Michael Whitworth, who's got a new commentary coming out. Uh, Plenty more on the way, and so be sure you're subscribed to Think Deeper on your favorite podcast app or check us out on YouTube. You can listen to each week there, Uh, if you will. If you're listening to it on a podcast app, be sure to as I said, subscribe and, and leave a rating. Five stars uh, helps helps us, uh, goes a long way. And so uh, please remember to do that and uh, just keep an eye out for next week's episode. And we'll talk to you guys then.